Masha, very recently there was this incredible series of videos that was kicked off by a video that was like a parody of an Italian music video of some years Which ago. Which was also a parody. Exactly. So, and it took Russia by storm and it went international. What was this all about and what did it mean? I mean first of all, this is the best, uh, most inspiring story that I have written that originates in Russia in so many years. <laughs> uh, but, and these are like 17, 18 year old boys who are studying to be uh, civilian pilots at an air transport academy in Ulyanovsk, which is a small town in Russia, shot a video uh, in which it's a spoof of a video uh, called Satisfaction made by uh, Ben Benassi, who is an Italian DJ. And, yeah, it's um, a homoerotic video. Yeah, it's, but it's, it's a homoerotic video that is not, uh, you know, that, that is very sort of um, culturally grounded, weirdly. It was an outrage. I mean, this is a country where propaganda of homosexuality is against the law. What was the basis for the outrage? Why <clears throat> this is, it's corrupting the morals of young Russian boys and men and women, or was it something deeper politically? Um, you know, I think they had, they had a lot of trouble sort of quite putting their finger on it. Ah, and why, did, why did they pay attention to it all? Why, did the, why would the official media deign to give it attention? Well, because the, the local officials were in a tizzy. Right. And they wanted these boys either uh, either suspended or you know otherwise disciplined, and the ministry got involved. I mean, it was it, it went up to that to a high level. So after that video came out, and after the television coverage, and after the governor said that they had to be disciplined, that's when suddenly all these people started making videos in support of these students. So they weren't just spoofs; they weren't just takeoffs. They were actual. You know, this was this was organizing. So this what is that telling you? We th we think of Russia today as in the midst of a conservative wave led by Vladimir Putin, and it's not just conservative vis-a-vis -vis the United States or uh, democracy or anti-democracy. We think of it in terms of a a kind of Russian version of what used to be known as the moral majority. Oh yeah, absolutely. And, and Putin uses that language. I mean, he talks about traditional values and family values and, and all that sort of thing. Um, some were directly imported from the, from the United States. So you saw this proliferation of videos as a sign of a kind of dissidence in a way. Yes. It's also a really inspiring show of solidarity. To, to paint some contrast, you wrote about for the New Yorker at a certain point the fact that in Chechnya, a region of, of Russia, gay men and women who were imprisoned, sequestered, uh, in the cruelest way possible. I mean, this is reality on the ground in Russia today, too. They were rounding up gay men, a few lesbians, but mostly gay men, uh, and lesbians not because they're more lenient toward lesbians, but because generally it's enough to just tell the family to take care of the problem and they will kill the woman. In yeah. Russia in general or in Chechnya in particular? In Chechnya, in Chechnya. They're rounding up uh, gay men, uh, torturing them, getting them to give up names of other gay men, and then usually releasing them to their families with the orders to those families to kill them. And on a number of occasions it appears that those murders were carried out. Now, you see these videos as a kind of, in, in a way, a protest against this kind of cruelty, against this kind of politics. And yet we're about to have an election in Russia in, in March in which Putin is, as it were, running for president and with really no opposition in sight and absolutely no chance of his losing. Am I right? I mean, opposition, it depends on what you mean by opposition, right? So uh, no one can get on the ballot without Putin's permission. So there are several people on the ballot, most of them no one has ever heard of. Uh, and then there's Ksenia Sobchak, who's a very interesting project. She's a young woman who I think is really trying to use the campaign to talk about things that are not normally talked about in Russia and has been quite brave about doing this stuff. What issues does she raise that, that, that don't get? Well, she went to Chechnya and spoke up uh, about uh, political murders in Chechnya, which is something that no Russian politician has done in more than a decade. I mean, that took incredible guts. Uh, she also has talked about the fact that Alexei Navalny, who's who, the great anti-corruption campaigner, the great anti-corruption campaigner, and probably the man who would 
have the best chance of beating Putin if he were actually allowed to be on the ballot and if he were actually allowed to campaign, which His of course he is not. His brother has been thrown into prison and he from time to time is arrested at one demonstration or another. And he's lost uh, most of the sight in one of his eyes because he's been physically attacked uh, and he has charges pending against him on all sorts of stuff. I mean, it's amazing the man is still walking around and it's even more amazing that he's still doing his work. In an open election, I mean, there's a lot of ifs about to come. In, in an open election, would Navalny have a chance to beat Putin if, there were, if he had access to the media, if there were actual debates, if they were debating on the substance of political issues? Would Putin be truly vulnerable? All the media are dominated by, by, by Putin. Um, there, there are debates, but Putin doesn't show up for debates because like, you know, that's beneath him. There is never any conversation about actual political issues. So there would actually be, uh, have to, to be sort of major structural and cultural shifts even to enable a free and open and fair election. So first you have to consider what would bring about those shifts so that an election like that could happen. And then, yeah, I think Putin would be incredibly vulnerable. In some, in some sense, the Russian election is not about who will win it but about what comes after Putin. There's a lot of discussion in, in Moscow and beyond about what comes after Putin, because he's how old now? So he'll be 66 this year. And this term is another six years, another and, six years and so on. I always tell people to go read Joshua Rubinstein's book, Last Days of Stalin, which is a wonderful book. But it also describes the absolute disarray that occurred after Stalin died, and how there was no succession plan. Stalin clearly also believed that he was going to live forever. It's going to be absolute chaos, and at that point, probably very briefly, anything will be possible. Now, we are under the impression that, or many of us are under the impression that Putin was delighted that Donald Trump won the election and had some kind of uh, uh, influencing hand in it. To what degree, we don't know. Um, what the exact nature of it is, we, we don't know exactly, but certainly some involvement or another. But there's also the sense that Putin's view of Trump has shifted in the years since he's in office. How is that the case and why? First of all, I think he was tickled that, Putin, that, that Trump had won. Uh, and I think that the because idea... Because he loved Trump so much or, or, or Trump was indebted to him in some way or because he loathed Hillary Clinton? Because he loathed Hillary Clinton and also because it was funny to consider that Trump could win. I mean, Putin has always th said that he was a clown. That famous quote Trump interprets as Putin saying that he is brilliant. Putin actually said he's colorful. Yarki. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and he meant, you know, he's a clown. Yeah. Um, he's a joke. Now, the thing is that Putin doesn't actually believe that there is such a thing as an election with an unpredictable outcome. So it was particularly hilarious that everyone was, including Putin, was planning for a Clinton victory and Trump won. And the fact that it was attributed to Putin making him the most powerful man in the world was really fun. Um, but of course, you know, I think he would have had a much easier time dealing with somebody more predictable like Hillary Clinton. Has Trump no been limits. bad for, for Putin in some way? Tr Putin has been quite frustrated with, with Trump. I mean, they, uh, and if you watch Russian television, you will see that they're, you know, they're talking about how Trump has failed to lift sanctions that are uh, related to Ukraine, how um, they're still pr very much portraying the war in Syria as a war that Russia is fighting against the United States in Syria. Right. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, you, they're not happy with Trump. He's unpredictable. Uh, he, he doesn't actually let Putin flex his muscle as much as Hillary with her confrontational stance would have let him do it. Uh, and he's, he's hard to deal with. Is there any winking acknowledgement in, in Russian political elites that in fact the special services had anything to do with the election? Is no, it a I think a point of pride or a point of denial? Uh, so Putin actually, uh, in December of last year, during his annual press conference for, for that year, uh, he, had a, a, he had a question tossed to him, because you know, all the questions are scripted. So he had a question tossed to him about how, what it felt like to be credited with having won the, the, the right. U.S. election. Which and, in spy novel terms would be the ultimate coup for a special service. Of course. Yeah. Uh, and you know, that's what he always dreamed of. I mean, his, um, to the extent that he's talked about himself, he's always said that uh, he wanted to be the, the guy who you know, manages, ch changes the world behind the scenes. Right. 
Uh, and I think he's much more comfortable in that role and finds it much more gratifying than the, the public role of, of, of the presidency, even though he's, he's kind of gotten to, to like that as well. But at the same, I mean, officially, of course, Russia denies everything and, and they ridicule it. Uh, but, but they sort of fan the flames of the conversation in Russia itself because it is terribly flattering. Over and over again, we are told by knowing voices that Putin's popularity rating hovers around 90%. Is that about right? 85, 86, yeah. Pretty good. Oh, yeah. I, a little lower Trump than... Trump can only dream of this. <laughs> <laughs> lower than some dictators, but uh, higher than most. Um, what accounts for that rating? What does it mean and what does it not mean? This is where it gets really difficult to talk about Russia in Western terms, right? It's, it, it already gets difficult when we use the word election, you know, to describe something that's not an election. But when we use the word the words public opinion to describe something that's not an opinion in a place where there's no public, um, <laughs> it becomes really hard. Uh, what does I that think, mean, no public? Well, there's no public sphere. There's no exchange of information that happens through the media or other means. There are tiny little pockets of atom, you know, atomized conversations that do not intersect and do not cross-pollinate. In other words, I can... If I turn on the television in, mm -hmm. in, in Moscow or any Russian town or city, I will not see any opposing voice except for one that's mocked or, or right. undermined in some way. I go to a bookstore, mm -hmm. I can find an enormous wealth of literature and, 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 and some political writing that during a Soviet period certainly you right. would never have seen. Right. Are they, in other words, is there a seeding to the intellectual class, a certain room to move a certain amount of um, uh, freedom so that they behave? I think of it more as a sort of economy of, of, of repression. Uh, and I think that was developing through the entire late Soviet period. The Soviet Union was sort of experimenting with that. It turned out that you don't have to jail millions of people to Which keep is expensive. everybody in line. The it's gulag very... is expensive. When you think about it, and you read the news reports here, um, all the analytical work, What's your sense if Putin has, quote unquote, has something on the president of the United States? Well, considering that this president doesn't seem to be capable of embarrassment, I take that with a grain of salt. Right. So what? Uh, I mean, you know, Stormy Daniels has some, something on the president of the United States. Yes, and when so that came what? out, that was the fourth most right. uh, read story of the day, not the most read. And if right. Barack Obama had done it, um, I think he'd be in, in Guantanamo. Right. Right. What is your sense of the way the Mueller investigation for Trump is going to go? Um, do you think he will be tripped up in some way by this whole saga that we loosely call the Russia scandal? I, I fear that we have inflated expectations for that uh, because I think that um, in, in a magical future in which the whole picture is laid out in front of us, I think it's not going to be quite as definitive and quite as clear um, as, as we hope. But also, you know, there's no, there's no path from that to impeachment, even if it were definitive, which I don't think it's going to, it's going to be. Um, we're just going to be sitting here thinking, really? Mm -hmm. And he's still president? And he will be. Masha, thank you. Thank you.